Let me start off a little differently this evening. Um, one of our saint, one of our wonderful members, Ingrid Klostner, had a terrible fall outside, and um, I think we should lift her up in prayer right now, shall we? <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. Lord, we thank you that we have within our midst people who care, who know and understand treatment, medical treatment. And Lord, we, we pray now for Ingrid, our beloved sister, that you would be with her in this, this time of need. We pray, Lord, for the medical community to give her the very best aid and, Lord, allow her to recover. Give her, Lord, recovery. Be with her and strengthen her in this time. Keep her, Lord, close to you. For, Lord, I know she is, she is so close to you in her heart. We thank you for Ingrid and ask that you bless her in Jesus' name. Amen. So some of us can remember back to an old gospel song called Give Me That Old Time Religion. It's kind of a strange tune to think about singing here in Lent. I mean, it's give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Well, okay. What is that? Old time religion. And for some, well, I guess for some it's the way that church used to go back in the days, right? The days. Um, I think about it when I was a kid, that's some years ago. Women of the church, ready at the drop of a hat to cook a great meal down in the church basement in the kitchen. It was always fantastic. Women who are part of sewing bees. Do you even know what a sewing bee is? They don't use that term anymore. Well, we have something like that, but we call it a different name. We call it the quilters. It was a time when the men owned the church building. That if anything needed to be fixed or constructed or anything, the men would step forward. They owned that building. There was a pride that was felt. For instance, when a junior in the family would grow old enough that, and be confirmed, he would be invited to an usher team that would give uh, dad and grandpa great pride. There would be three generations, maybe even four generations of family sitting in a pew, a couple pews. Sunday school was, was full. And kids were committed to perfect attendance in Sunday school. Some of you might even remember those, those little pins that you had. And for every, every year that you had perfect attendance, you, you would get a little bar that would hang down there. I know I, I see my dad. His, his was really long. He could do it. I was always sick. I could never get perfect attendance. Confirmation students. Not only would they memorize the small catechism, the meanings, but they would even memorize the questions and the answers and the scripture verses. And then they would stand in front of the congregation, and the congregation would ask them all the questions. I remember that. I was petrified. <laughs> Members who would memorize the hymns, they didn't even need hymnals. Can you imagine? Not much left from those days, is there? Maybe, of course, except the sewing bee. It's a trick of, is it a trick of memory just to think that things were better back in those days? Was there more willingness and dedication and enthusiasm in the church then? So what happened? Did the church become more enlightened or did it become more cynical and it's good enough became the well our saying maybe it's okay we don't do that old time religion anymore today or it's a sad state of the church today because we 
have lost some of that old time religion, do we need to return? Return, that's the theme for Lent. Return to the Lord your God. That's the whole theme. So during this next few weeks, up until Holy Week, and then through Holy Week, here's some of the themes. Return to prayer. Return from betrayal. Return from false witness. Return from denial. Return to the kingdom of God. Return to the table. Return to truth. Return to the church. Return and see what God has done for you. As we study the book of Joel, we will appreciate return. As old as this book of the Bible is, maybe, maybe it was written 900 years before Jesus. It still speaks to the 21st century. Let me tell you, this is old time religion right here. Joel, the prophet, spoke to the people in the southern kingdom of Judah. The book that bears his name is relatively short. It just has 73 verses broken into three chapters. It's rich and deep and complex. But yet, here's Joel's simple outline. It goes this way. Destruction is coming. Now, what is that destruction? Well, it's a plague of locusts. Our reading today kind of comes in the middle of, of Joel. But in the beginning, he's talking about how this this plague will come. And so he's saying, so fast at the temple, offer, offer prayers of lament over the coming destruction. And then he says there's something more significant that's coming. The day of the Lord is coming. It is near. And then Joel describes the Lord's army using the imagery of the destroying locust. He issues a call to return to the Lord, and he says, pray. Now, whether this is literal or figurative application of this plague, Joel's message is clear. A day of judgment will come. And so Joel pleads with the people to turn to God so that they will be found righteous in his sight great, at that great and awesome day. And God responds. Following the locust plague will come healing and restoration. So God, so Joel brings God's good news. He brings the promise. It's simply this. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They needed only return to the Lord their God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster that was in our reading today. Stop trusting in yourself. Trust in God only. By the way, they weren't going to stop the swarming locusts. Neither were they able to stop the judgment day. It will come. Everyone. All people will be affected And the only solution is to return to the Lord. Today, we are afraid of a pandemic, the COVID-19 disease, virus. But you know what we really need is to be afraid of the locust that Joel speaks of. And that locust that he's speaking of is sin. Your sin. Your sins are the locusts. And it's not one or two. It's a swarm. And a swarm that covers everything. When the entire list of your deeds is considered, it's breathtaking and terrifying. If the wages of sin is death, as Paul wrote, and if, as Ezekiel wrote, the soul whose sins shall die, then the locust swarm of our sins is frightening Indeed, the swarm is upon us. Large or small, sin is sin. And by the way, in God's kingdom, there really is no such thing as a little sin. They're all death-giving. One has led 
one has led to a swarm of locusts to cover the earth. It started right there in the beginning. And we are adding to the swarm each and every day, not just about lying and stealing and cheating and swearing and grumbling and all those Ten Commandment things. But it's also something very subtle, something that, in fact, it's, it's kind of insidious. It's ignoring and forgetting, denying, avoiding. So what about that old-time religion in our churches today? Well, think about it. Have you served on a mission of compassion lately? Have you solved a need, helped a neighbor, righted a wrong? Have you ducked and covered from a request to serve in the church? Guys, are you currently serving in a men's ministry? Do we have a men's ministry? We don't. Are your children and grandchildren worshiping regularly? Do kids take a pride in perfect attendance in Sunday school? Is there even Sunday school? Has confirmation become graduation in your family? When kids confirm they don't see them in church again. Have you ever grumbled about the choices of the hymns that we make? So you might say, well, this is no big deal. This is... This is simply how, how it is. But you see, that's the insidious nature of the locust. It can be, well, we can take it as it's not a big deal. But it is. Sin is sin. And anything that doesn't go to the glory of God is the swarm of locusts. By the way, really the question that's underneath all that is this. Are you giving the very best to the Lord? Have we exchanged the best with what's left? I will if I can't. You see, nothing is more important than adorning the bride of Christ, and that's our church, with absolute willingness, commitment, and enthusiasm. But of course, there's another side to this, a flip side. And this is what Jesus spoke about in his gospel. And that's when we do things so that, well, people will notice. We do it for the accolades, for public recognition, and some good works investment. In other words, we do these good things to set aside a, a treasure that we will, that we will um, make a, uh, make a um, withdraw on when the judgment day comes. And so, God, here's the things that I have done. This gets me into heaven, right? Nope, doesn't work that way at all. That's what Jesus is saying. Eternal death and damnation from what we have done, what our swarm of, of locusts should absolutely terrify you. But Joel brings good news for you. He brings a promise, and it's simply this. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's so simple. That's how it is with the Lord. Salvation is simple. He simply does it for you. You don't have to do anything. You know that, that wonderful gospel song, Give Me That Old Time Religion? I looked it up, Googled it. And I had, to, I had to see a little bit more about what are the verses in there. And you know, there, there are a lot of verses. Um, Do you know this was written in 1873? He was uh, an African-American uh, spiritual. Came from North Carolina. And there's some wonderful verses in here. Like, for instance, this. It will bring you out of bondage. It will bring you out of bondage. It will bring you out of bondage, and it's good enough for me. Boy, isn't that so true? Isn't that the gospel? It's that message brings us out of bondage, and it will do when the world's on fire. It will do when the world's on fire. It will do when the world's on fire, and it's good enough for me. Give me that old-time religion. Wow. 
That's great. It's what's going to save us from hell. It's old time religion. It's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. And it begins this way. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. In spite of your failures, lifeless faith, and just plain rejection of God, he invites you to return to him, and he promises to bless you. So stop trusting in yourself and look to God. Know that you can't stop the swarming locusts, and you can't stop Judgment Day. It will come, all will be affected but you can return, return to the Lord. It's the only solution that you have for the coming tide. Return to the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.